Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Good evening. Mon nom est Joanne Charette. Uh, my name is Joanne Charette. On, be, on behalf of the Governor's count, uh, Board and the President of IDRC, I'm delighted to welcome you to our eighth public, annual public assembly. Plan for the next hour. I would like to mention that simultaneous interpretation is available in French on number two, en français numéro deux, and in English on uh, channel number one. And if you just want to listen to the floor, it's channel number three. Headsets are available at the back of the room. Veuillez noter que la réunion sera filmée. This meeting will be recorded, and you can view the recording on the website. IDRC.ca. Puis nos gouverneurs euh, et collègues du CRDI seront ensuite disponibles pour discuter avec vous. And now it gives me my uh, great pleasure to introduce the chairperson of IDRC's Board of Governors, Margaret Biggs, who will be chairing the meeting this evening. Margaret? Uh, thank you very much, Joanne. Merci beaucoup. And, uh, Good evening, bonsoir, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps here, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for this annual general meeting. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you to the eighth annual public meeting of IDRC. As you know, IDRC to address some of the most pressing challenges facing the developing world. And in a moment, you're going to hear from uh, our uh, president, the IDRC president, Jean Lebel, followed by a, a short some presentations about how IDRC is promoting employment growth for women and girls in developing countries, a ma major area of emphasis for the center. First, though, I'd like to take the opportunity just to introduce to you our board of governors who are meeting here this week in Ottawa. And I'm just going to ask each of our governors to stand up as I introduce them, if you don't mind. Um, we have an invigorated, reinvigorated board uh, following some new appointments, seven new appointments, including my appointment as chair in June. And these appointments came through uh, the Government of Canada's new open, transparent, uh, uh, merit-based appointment process. And I think if you noticed in the papers the other day, it's a majority of the board members are now women. And that was noted as being a plus. So first, let me introduce our, our vice chairperson, Chandra Madramutu. He's a professor in the Department of Bioresource Engineering at McGill University in Montreal. And then we have Marianne Chambers, is a former Ontario government minister, and prior to that worked in the private sector, and she's based in uh, Toronto, Thornhill. And Dominique, uh, president et membre du Conseil de la Fond President and member of the board of the Teasdale Corti Foundation, and she also sits on the board of the Lacor Hospital in Gulu in Uganda, and she lives in Milan in Italy. Now, um, two or three of our board governors who were ill today, but we have uh, Sophie Dumour, is the professor of the Department of uh, Mechanical Engineering at the Université de Laval, uh, and she resides in Quebec City. Scott Gilmore is a social entrepreneur, writer, and president of Anchor Chain, which helps small businesses in frontier markets connect to investment and international supply chains, and he's based here in Ottawa. And uh, Alana Heath, who was formerly the vice president of government affairs at Barrett Gold Corporation, and uh, she's based in, in Toronto. Unfortunately, they're not able to come because they've got the bug. But we also we do have here with us today Shainur Koja, who's the managing director of Better Business Enterprises, and she has a background in using technology and innovative business models to build capacity. And she's currently based out of Dubai. She's a Canadian based out of Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates. John MacArthur, Canadian from Vancouver, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and senior advisor on sustainable development to the United Nations Foundation, and he's based in Washington D.C. Yuri, in his lucky chair over here, Yuri Rosenthal is a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in the Netherlands. He's also served as a member of the Senate in his country, and he's based in Rotterdam. And Barbara Trenholm is a business and accounting professor emerita 
at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, and she sits on a number of, of corporate boards here in Canada. It's a great pleasure to work with these individuals um, as we come together um, as almost a brand new board. Now, in the past year, three governors stepped down at the end of their terms. I'd just like to take a moment to thank them because they did a tremendous job, Nadir Patel, Gordon Hulden, and also in particular Monty Salberg, who's not here with us today, but who served as the acting chairperson for IDRC for, I guess, well over a year and a bit. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out at the outset here is the board worked this year with the Office of the Auditor General, who undertook a special examination of IDRC. This is something that's done uh, every 10 years. It's an in-depth, independent review of federal crown corporations, and they, so this is something that was done uh, as part of their regular schedule. Et uh, l'analyse a uh, globalement... The analysts, the analysis raised some positive points. The only improvement needed was the Board of Governors with the addition of new members. Given the appointments that came through in June. Now in August, I have to say, uh, some of us that were able to, uh, as a delegation of governors, were able to visit IDRC's programs and operations in, in two countries in, Latin, in the Latin American region, Colombia and Peru. We happened to be in Colombia just on the eve of the very historic plebiscite around their peace process. Um, this, this visit for, for the board had, had three primary uh, purposes. First of all, was really to learn about IDRC's program, its partners, and the work that IDRC is doing on the ground in those countries. Also, to be to develop and facilitate a knowledge exchange uh, with with our partners there, and to build bridges and partly knowledge bridges between the work that's going on on the ground and the kind of oversight and foresight responsibilities we have in the board. Uh, across the hall in, in the boardroom. And it was absolutely uh, a terrific uh, learning exercise and a, a great validation of the work that IDRC is doing on behalf of Canada uh, and the developing world. So I'd like to share one, one example that I think a lot of us found to be particularly inspiring. We were in Colombia. We visited a school in uh, Itagüe, which is just outside of uh, Bogota, sort of a suburb of Bogota, where uh, IDRC supports an education research project. And, of course, it, it's always wonderful when you're meeting with children in a school environment. It was very heartwarming. They sang. We sang, Oh, Canada. It was, it was kind of a, one of those brings a tear to your eye uh, moments. Um, but the project was really what made the, the visit worthwhile. Uh, the project's called Unlocking the Future of Education in Colombia, and it's uh, basically scaling up educational innovations uh, to uh, test what kinds of methodologies would work to allow uh, students and their teachers to, to um, be able to learn better and to be able to scale that up across their, um, across their district. And it embodies how IDRC works in a number of ways. It supported research that's scaling up innovation, so it was being proven in the local situation, but then it was be able to scale up. And it was just demonstrating the, the benefits of bringing people together from many different disciplines to solve the problems. And this, this project, we, we saw with our own eyes how successful it had been, but it was also going to be taken to the state level and then possibly even to the national level, and that's a key element in IDRC's strategic plan, which is to go to scale as much as possible. We all spoke, I think Dominique took a number of pictures, we spoke with students and teachers who told us how using digital tools to improve education, that the impact it was having, not just on their learning, but on their lives, and the way in which they could actually uh, learn better, um, and how the families could be more involved in the learning, which we also know is a key determinant of successful, successful learning. So it was really inspiring. So that's just one anecdote for me. I'm going to turn now to uh, to our and introduce our, our president uh, Jean Lebel to talk a little bit more about IDRC's work, and then we're going to hear from a couple of uh, a couple of uh, IDRC's uh, key personnel. Uh, Jean has served as IDRC's president since 2013, and he brings a wealth of experience, having previously served as a vice president of programs and partnership branch, where he oversaw all of IDRC's programming, and he has. Um, expansive ex expertise and knowledge across a whole range of issues, but he's particularly strong in everything related to agriculture and environment. So, Jean, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Merci. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam President of the Board, uh, and thank you to all of you to have come 
here tonight uh, at the uh, IDRC. Uh, premises. Uh, so we have here members of the diplomatic corps of uh, diplomatic corps and the new governors that I'm uh, greeting with great pleasure. When we met last year during the annual public assembly, one of the recurrent themes was change. And this year, the uh, principal theme that I will be uh, presenting is action. Last year, we put into place a new strategic plan for five years for the work at the center, uh, which will be in effect until 2020. We're currently implementing this plan and we're gradually progressing towards our uh, towards achieving our objectives. Last year's, we were at the very first uh, beginnings of a new federal government. Now we are working in close collaboration with the Minister of International Development and Francophonie uh, Minister Marie Claude Bibot. We actively took part in the study of the Canadian policy of uh, international aid. And last year, we also had a group of employees at IDRC who unionized, and we started a process of negotiating IDRC's first collective agreement. It's a very interesting exercise. It's a challenge that we're taking up along with our employees, and this is all contributing to make of this year a fascinating year. I'm sharing with you a few examples of what this year of action looked like where it mattered the most, and I mean in developing countries where we are helping to build knowledge, innovations, and solutions that improves people's lives. But first, I will briefly discuss the broader landscape within which we are working. Globally, this landscape includes the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and other important international commitments, including the Paris Agreement to address climate change that was ratified last November. We are actively engaged in these efforts. IDRC provides knowledge and support to scientists whose technical assistance is crucial to the process underlying these agreements and often that are done by skilled negotiator. At IDRC, we make sure, among many other things, to make sh we make sure that the voices of Southern experts have a place in the negotiations. For instance, last year, 25 IDRC grantees contributed evidence to the intergovernmental panel on climate changes in its fifth assessment report. We also, and this is less known, provided support to nine researchers from Africa who contributed their expertise on agriculture and gender to the African group of negotiators during the conference in Paris. And this year, uh, this group was composed of eight new members that helped to move the conversation with the African uh, negotiators. Here in Canada, the federal government's international assistance review was the first of its kind in 21 years, and it's ongoing. We were quite honored to co-host with Global Affairs Canada, the first of the review's consultation session, which focused on governance, pluralism, diversity, and human rights. In line with this, we also contributed to session on green growth, innovation, and science, LGBTQ2 rights, because, you know, I need to use the right acronym now, and sexual and reproductive rights. In addition, we have also regional presence in Cairo, in Nairobi, in Delhi, and in Montevideo, and each of these regional offices have participated in session to help refine this new international aid policy. Je souhaiterais maintenant mettre l'accent sur trois exemples en particulier. I'd like to emphasize that three uh, issues. Uh, women's rights, uh, climate change, and 
refugees. First of all, we're taking part in research which、uh, empower women and girls. This participation takes several forms. For example, we're supporting an initiative called、um, Economic Growth and Economic Opportunities for Women, which is producing、uh, data on the economic empowerment of women and economic growth in countries with low incomes. As the president of the board said,、uh, Marianne, you will,、uh, or Margaret said, you will he- soon hear our experts、uh, tell you about this, Marianne and Martha. So I'll give you an example. In Mexico, Prospera, the main employment insurance program, gives payments to seven million women who have low income, so that their children can go to school, so that they can receive health services and be well fed. However. However, the banking infrastructure is limited outside of the large cities, which means that payments must be made in cash for about 120,000 communities. The、uh, IDRC helps the Mexican government to implement a solution which allows. People to take advantage of the fact that a majority of Mexicans have a cell phone rather than a bank account. This solution is called Prospera Digital and allows payments to be made directly on cell phones. We also support research aiming to enlighten and improve policies and activities, and to allow other countries to、uh, take advantage of the lessons learned here. We were proud to see our Prime Minister. Mr. Trudeau talked about this project when he met the Mexican President、uh, Enrique Peña Nieto last summer. This project was cre- was、uh, praised for its、um, success in decreasing vulnerabilities, improving well-being, and creating social mobility for women and、uh, girls and people without any citizenship, reaching、uh, an astronomic number of 65 million. At least in 2015, and we are doing our part to help along with other, with other Canadian government departments and agencies. We are supporting a project that will improve the accessibility and the quality of education for Syrian refugees and host community and host community children using digital tools and resources. In Lebanon, it's 1.2 million refugee. In Syria, in Syria, in Jordan, it's about 700,000 refugees. Half of them are less than 18 years of age, and half of them don't have access to school because of limitation in the infrastructure or ability of teacher. This program that we are supporting is developing new tools and train teachers to be able to reach out to these group. Of citizen of you that don't have access to education, and it's quite important because imagine those children if they don't have access to education, what type of this is citizen they will become over time until the Syrian conflict is resolved. In fact, this project was also highlighted by our Prime Minister during、uh, the、uh, United Nations General Assembly uh, and uh, pre-meeting on refugee. And here, it's not only abroad. Here, we are doing our part also on the refugee. With the Canadian Institute of Health Research, we have partnered to support postdoctoral and early entry research grant for researcher coming from refugee population. It's not always, you know, very poor people, very, you know.、Uh, Excluded people that are refugee. It's often extremely talented and skilled people. So, with this program, we are hoping that we will give opportunity to refugee to enter into Canada and pursue their career. Un autre exemple, les changements climatiques, et ce sera mon dernier au cours des dernières années. Nous... Another example, my last example,、uh, which is related to climate change, is that over the past ten years, we've invested more than 190 million Canadian dollars with our、uh, British partners and American partners in 150 research projects, and we've supported more than 1,000 researchers in、uh, climate change.、Uh, an example that was published in Canadian Geographic was the work that we carry out. In Ghana, on the coastal erosion in the Volta Delta.
thanks to the use of drones, we can measure uh, much more quickly the effects of climate change on erosion in very uh, remote areas. This is a very important phenomenon because it uh, affects mostly the most vulnerable populations who are settling in these fragile areas. Thanks to this technology and to the research we're doing, we are able to observe this erosion much more quickly and we can uh, intervene more rapidly with uh, uh, mitigation measures. As well as our partner take action to deliver on international commitments as well as contributing to important dialogue here in Canada about our country international assistance priorities. It is equally important for us to focus on monitoring and measuring so we can track progress and identify gaps. We do this at the program, at the project levels at IDRC, but we do it also in comparing where we are with the objectives that we have set for ourselves with our strategic plan that will run up to 2020. This year, we delivered the first annual performance report of our strategic plan. It's a work in progress. It examines our performance, and it gives us an idea on how well we are progressing. Up to now, the results are encouraging, but there's still area that we have to work more. The performance, ex the performance report also explores how IDRC-supported research contribute to positive change in the life of peoples in the developing world. And as such, we are then using this to show how we are progressing with a framework like the Sustainable Development Goals. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut conclure de tout ceci? Eh bien, au Canada et dans le monde entier, on observe une volonté réelle. What can we conclude from all this? Well, here in Canada and in the whole world, we can see a, a repeated will to ch truly change the condition of people living in developing countries. Also, it becomes clear that the only way of achieving determinative results at the world level is to collaborate and to create partnerships. IDRC play, has an important role to play in this dialogue. We know how to identify the problems, how to define them, how to find appropriate partners, how to implement solutions, and how to deploy them to have maximal impact. But also, we've proved many times that the only common denominator to uh, the best knowledge, the best solutions, and to the best management is this local aspect. This is the message that we communicate wherever we go. I think people who are there at the local level uh, have more knowledge, and when they contribute, these solutions are much more sustainable than others. So this is the message that we're presenting you and uh, that we also carry wherever we go. Thank you for your presence here today. I'd like to thank our uh, governors for their advice and their uh, constant support. And I also would like to thank our new pres board president, Margaret uh, Biggs. Margaret, you bring... Uh, much uh, knowledge and uh, many uh, skills to this position, to this work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Sean. Now, it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Ariane, Ariane Dehan and Martha Meles. Now, Ariane is the program leader for the Employment and Growth uh, Group. He joined IDRC six years ago, and his team's work includes a focus on women's economic empowerment and innovative solutions to youth unemployment. And previous, previously, Ariane was a senior lecturer at the International Institute of Social Studies in Rotterdam and a social development advisor with the United Kingdom's uh, Department for International Development, uh, DFID. And he holds a PhD in social history from the Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And with him is, is Martha. She's the Senior Program Specialist, Employment and Growth, and her work is focused on youth employment and women's economic empowerment in sub-Saharan Africa. And since joining IDRC in 1993, Martha has worked in various programs covering areas such as inclusive growth, social policy, and strengthening health systems. And Martha holds a PhD in public policy from Carleton University uh, with a focus on health financing and reform. Um, the two of them are going to tell us now about uh, the specific area that IDRC is working on in terms of supporting employment growth among women and girls. So over to you.
Thank you so much to uh, the chair. Thank you to our uh, president. Good evening, bonsoir, good Um We are uh, very pleased uh, and honored to present to you a small part part of the work of, uh, of IDRC. Uh, between Marta and I, we have worked for IDRC for about 20 years, and at every visit to our projects and partners, we are impressed and, and each time humbled to see how Canadian support can help make a difference for the lives of people around the world. As was mentioned, Marta and I represent uh, the program uh, Employment and Growth, Emploi et Croissance. Uh, la recherche que nous... The research that we fund is aimed at eliminating barriers to economic opportunities, namely by proposing solutions that will help eliminate the barriers for women and youth who want to find jobs, well-paying jobs. Since the major part of employments are created by the private sector, we are cooperating with it through our projects. We mainly support the actors and initiatives, including a social dimension to their activities. We will start with an overview of the key employment challenging in developing countries. And with, within that, why it is important to focus on challenges young people and women face. We will then discuss what r role research can play and what has been the IDRC experience. And finally, given our experience, what work do we see as priorities moving forward? So what is the main development challenge we focus on? Many economies have experienced good and sustained economic growth, but this is not creating enough jobs. Moreover, very few jobs are in the so-called formal sector, in companies with registration and protection. Many poor people run small businesses, are self-employed or work as employees in small and informal enterprises without social and job security. In South Asia and Africa, 70 to 80 percent of people outside agriculture work in this informal sector. And this has not changed over the last 20 years, despite the economic growth. In most regions, women are overrepresented in the informal sector. However, this is not the case everywhere. For example, we see in the Middle East, in the informal sector, women are not overrepresented. But women there also enter the labor market much less than men. Different constraints thus exist in different regions, and it's important to understand the reasons for this. In the same way, youth face particularly, particular challenges in this generally challenging employment context. Youth, employ, youth unemployment is always much higher than unemployment overall. For example, in Asia, four to five times as many young men and women are unemployed compared to adults. In Africa, recorded unemployment for youth is not as high, but that is mostly because young people have to find work mostly in informal jobs. So given that employment is a global challenge, and women and youth face particular challenges within that, particular barriers, what does IDRC do to contribute to solutions? So our work helps boost economic prospects for young people. The reality for many young people as they transition from school to work is that jobs are hard to find. And this has become one of the critical challenges that societies around the world as, uh, are grappling with, as we all know. In many developing countries, young people are creating their own jobs to improve their economic prospects, and entrepreneurship is seen as the solution. But who are these young entrepreneurs? What are the challenges that they face? Which ones have the potential to grow? And how can programs and policies support their aspirations? Through IDRC support, there is now data for the first time that can help answer these questions in over 15 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. While there are differences across countries and regions, a common lesson is this. Young people are entering into the world of business with limited know-how and with little resources, and the result is high failure rate in business. Policymakers are listening and are now increasingly quoting this data in discussions about how to boost small businesses and support youth ventures. For example, in Vietnam, with this data in hand, the National Assembly is considering introducing legislations to support small businesses. Similarly, IDRC's work is addressing the barriers that hold women back. 
One of the barriers is women's burden of work in the household, which, as we know, adds more demand on their time, as they also provide for their family through paid employment. This is a phenomenon that is often referred to as women's double burden. The evidence is clear on this, as we can see from uh, this infographic and reported in the recent uh, Global Gender Gap Index. On average, women work longer hours than men in any given day. And they spend almost five hours a day doing unpaid work caring for their families, while men spend only one and a half hours doing, doing the same. Mind you, this is a global average, and the gap is even wider when we look at some of uh, the developing country data. It is estimated that 865 million women worldwide have the potential to contribute more fully to their economies, but are hold back. And over 90% live in low and middle income countries. So what can be done? Our work is testing the pro provision, whether the provision of daycare is one of the missing links that can unlock the full potential of women at work, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where women spend significant amount of time caring for our children. This is providing new evidence on the economic returns of expanding affordable and quality childcare options for poor women. It is also exploring sustainable financing solutions that work for low-income contexts. This work is ongoing, but it's already um, generated a lot of interest both locally and internationally. In Kenya, for example, this, the Nairobi City Council is working with IDRC-supported researchers to help improve the quality of childcare in the city's low-income settlement. We were very honored to participate at the UN high-level panel on women's economic empowerment earlier this year. And IDRC's contribution uh, was very valued. And we hosted a consultation on how to reduce women's burden drawing on the work that we are supporting. And this fed into the global report that was launched a few months ago. In Latin America, cash transfer programs, essentially a social safety net for the poor, have been very successful. They've reduced poverty, helped reduce inequalities, provided incentives to, family, for, to families to educate children and bring them to health clinics. In this context, the main challenge is the following. Can channeling, channeling these cash transfers through the banking system provide incentives for the poor to save and to invest? particularly in the small case activities that poorer people like uh, the woman in the uh, picture rely on. IDRC works with uh, two organizations in more than 10 countries, as highlighted in the, in the map here, that help the poor enhance their livelihoods. Partner organizations like Proyecto Capital provide marginalized groups with access to saving accounts and with financial training to help them use their savings to enhance their small business. The work has reached 400,000 beneficiaries. The research supported by IDRC helps to show what impact this has and what can be done to improve these programs. The research we supported has shown that getting a savings account and financial education can improve the small businesses. For example, invest in animals by as much as 10% and at, at very low program cost, and thus increase incomes and well-being. Research in specific countries has helped convince other governments in the region to adapt such policies. And we also plan to share those lessons with other countries, other regions, to see if partners there can adapt such innovations for their development challenge. Final example is from our work to support women entrepreneurs. Globally, about one-third of businesses are owned by women but they face many disadvantages in access to training, finance, and markets. And these are on top of the double burden that Marta spoke about. IDRC is partnered with Women's Economic Connect, a global non-profit organization that helps women connect to large companies, including to large uh, Canadian companies like the TD Bank, which have committed themselves to buying from women and women-owned and minority businesses. Canadian support helped them build a database through which women can register and which makes it possible to understand the characteristics of growth-oriented firms. 
We supported the development of this in India, which is also a pilot to use in 17 other developing countries. I was fortunate uh, to attend last week a very large meeting with some 2,000 entrepreneurs and witnessed the great interest that the reform-minded state government of Karnataka showed for this work. Our support in the first year has helped 600 Indian women-owned businesses register in the database, and 60 are certified to supply to large companies. And this has helped generate additional revenue of 170 million Canadian dollars annually and employ more than 4,600 people across India. We hope that uh, these examples have given you some insight into our work and of course we'd be very happy to share more details and, and answer any questions. In line with IDRC's strategic objectives, we are building knowledge leaders that contribute to finding local solutions and we are working with partners to achieve large-scale positive impact on the well-being of women and youth as we hope the examples have illustrated. In closing, allow us to highlight a few areas where we believe more work is needed. We need to bring together evidence to show that we can address inequalities while promoting economic growth at the same time. Some examples exist, but there's a constant need to show how this can be achieved. Unemployment will continue to be a key development priority. On top of existing challenges, we also need to understand and promote innovations and technological change that helps create new jobs. For Canada, trade and trade agreements are critically important, perhaps now more than ever. There's a big role for us to show that and how expanding global connections can help marginalized groups. And with projects like these and new ones, <clears throat> we support, we, and we proudly support Canada's international development efforts, particularly with respect to the empowerment of women and youth in low-income countries. We thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and Martha, for your presentation. That was really interesting. Uh, you clearly demonstrated how uh, investing in um, women and girls and young people can have a tremendous multiplier effect in their communities and their economies. Um, we're going to turn now, uh, really, over to you. It's about your tour. We're here. Nous serons en route de répondre à vous. We'll be happy to answer your questions in English or in French. There are two microphones. Uh, they're here and there. Identify yourself. And we invite you to make your voice heard. About IDRC in general, uh, for the president or for myself, but in particular for the for the researchers as well. Don't be shy. No? Please. Uh, Tim Shore, I'm very glad Tim to Shore. be home. Um, but we just started a new PhD in Boston. I think well, Tim, just push your oh, microphone. Is it on? Just come closer to the Or come closer. Yeah, it's on. So, Tim Shaw. Um, we just returned, my, uh, Jane Papan and myself, from Boston uh, for three years running a new PhD in global governance and human security. And my bit was simple global governance. Um, that's humor. Um, and I'm, I wonder to what extent IDRC, uh, like our students, are having to deal with new partners, not just the BRICS, not just TIC, um, but uh, obviously a range of new foundations uh, as well as countries, uh, all the things that China is investing in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the uh, the Belt and the Road, etc., uh, etc. Et I'd just be very interested in your perspectives on how your world uh, is changing, and there may be a little more competition out there, both now and in the future. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. You know, a few years ago when we start the process of our strategic plan uh, development, uh, as part of the early work, you know, we asked ourselves what has changed in the landscape. And, you know, we came with uh, a motto that says, you know, IDRC is unique, but we're not alone anymore. And, uh, you know, if you compare to 40 years ago when we were created and where we are now, it's quite a different institution. I think that uh, this has plenty of opportunity. This 
cause also some potential problem. The opportunity, I think, has been in the growth of our partnership with other like-minded organization. If you look at the current IDRC budget, we receive about $142 million from the Canadian government. Sylvain, am I right? $149. My apologies on that one. You know, it's because it's in two portion. You know, I missed the second one. Um, the 149 uh, to which we are adding $80 million of revenue that comes from the Brits, DFID, Department for International Development, Australia through the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, Norway through their uh, development agency, and Large Philanthropic Foundation, Bell and the Gates Foundation, Hewlett Foundation. Um, and there's a few others, and there's always a pipeline that we're working. When we are doing these partnerships, you know, we are doing it according According to very simple rules, are we ready to invest our own money into the partnership? And when we are ready to do this, we develop the mechanism to have you know equal footing on the governance of those partnerships, and securing that every partner is satisfied with the outcome that we are achieving with the program. Climate change comes to mind, uh, economic growth comes to mind, uh, think tank development comes to mind, food security comes to mind. You know, there is an area of activity of IDRC with partner that is now part of our main state and we anticipate it will stay the same. <coughs> this is the right size. The challenging size is that uh, there's number of a factor and you need to be quite strategic in picking or associating yourself with the right one. Uh, many of our conversation tends to be transactional but that's the nature of the business and when they come to uh, not a failure but not, you know, the realization of the partnership, it's time that we are devoting and building a relationship. We see this as, you know, sometimes difficult, but I see it as an investment in the future. If it does not work this time, maybe it will work another time. Second dimension is that we are uh, in a very strategic moment where we start to have far more insight and relationship with private sector actors. No, private sector, you know, is is a mixed bag when you start to look at it. Uh, there are private philanthropy, you know, Hewlett Foundation, Bell and Melinda Gates Foundation, Ford Foundation. You know, these are actors that we have always been working with, and we will continue. Then, within our project, uh, there is a number of private sector actors that are contributing to the development of project. Uh, let's take our food security program. There's a full sector of this program that looks at the private sector role in scaling up innovation that have been developed. Uh, I could take the example of develop, uh, development uh, international de jardin, you know, the large co-op movement in Quebec that is partnering with us in uh, Burkina Faso and Benin, I believe, in order to scale up innovation. And then there is the more delicate one where it's a private sector investment with IDRC investment with a pure private sector, you know, actor. Uh, Let's take an example that I've materialized last year. Tim Horton, a uh, coffee uh, retailer in Canada that everyone knows. We are partnering with Tim Horton in order to enhance the capacity of coffee grower in Colombia to have quality and quantity that are stable and better at the face of the threat of, not the threat, but actually the effects of climate change, whether it's on pests, whether it's on farming practices. Now, you know, when we are doing these partnerships, we are coming to grips that it's far more efficient to put it resource, to put our resource in parallel. You know, Tim Horton is paying for a certain portion, we are paying for the other portion. In that specific case, we are supporting two universities in Colombia to develop the technology, the farming practices to have it tested in the field. Tim Horton is supporting the take, the pickup, the take uh, up of these innovations through the coffee grower cooperative movement with the hope that they will integrate it in their practice and they are supporting it and that way what is coming out of the pipe is better coffee, better quality, better quantity and better revenue for uh, uh, the farmer. 
It's an experiment. We're looking at how it's evolving, and I think that might be a way for the future in certain area with our investment with private sector. Thank you. Yes, I just encourage you, yeah, please, just to come to the microphone and, um, and introduce yourselves. Thank you. Nuba Banuji. I'm um, Exida several years and um, now teaching at Carlton and Ottawa Youth. Um, I'm interested to know your current and perhaps future plans for involvement in fragile and conflict countries because these are supposed to be our government's priority investment locations. Um, development investment locations. So what are uh, the plans that IDRC have? Thank you. Yeah. Well, you know, I cannot get into the details of everything of what we're doing, but I'm going to give you a very high-level view. First of all, you know, our thematic area revolves around inclusive economy, agriculture, environment, as well as technology and innovation. Are we present in fragile state? Yes, definitely. Uh, we have have been working for numbers of years in different countries. I'll take an example. We are currently working in Lebanon and Jordan with refugee populations. You know, this is an area where it's very timely, it's very opportune, and it's very efficient to have IDRC in the field. We can and low-income fragile site also. So, you know, I cannot, after the, the conference we will be meeting, we can discuss specific case. But we are not risk adverse. We are quite risk tolerant. But we do a very thorough assessment of our investment before moving in situation that uh, creates risk. Uh, we are always driven by the same rational. Is this good science? Is this responded to a demand of the researcher, institution, and community? We are not interfering in political process. That's not our job. Our job is research for development. And the moment that we feel there's a threat, to our researcher, I can tell you there's a thorough assessment that is made in order to prevent any difficulties. Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Margaret Huber. I'm president of the Canadian International Council's National Capital Branch. In my experience in an international career, Canadians are very generous. As long as they think the money is well spent. And I think IDRC has a terrific story to tell in this regard, as we're hearing today. But I wonder what more can be done to get out this message not only to our governments, both nationally and uh, at other levels as well, but also to young Canadians, particularly youth and young professionals. And how can organizations like ours support you in that regard? Thank you. Great Thanks. question, and I'm turn all these great questions to Jean. <laughs> <laughs> and you know I have my vice president and my and staff Joanne, in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, Margaret, thanks for the question. This is excellent. Let me tell you uh, two very practical examples of what we do in order for the world to know better what we're doing, and the world, I mean the Canadian world. Uh, I testify uh, earlier this year in front of the Foreign Affairs International Development Committee uh, on the uh, issue of um, country of focus and uh, what should be the approach of the Canadian government. Um, why am I raising it? Because it was the four, first time in the last four years that we received an invitation. And the uh, committee has uh, produced its report last week and took into consideration seriously some of the elements that we brought into the conversation on the issue of, you know, corruption, good financing, 
standing of IDRC. Yesterday, we received an invitation to appear in front of the uh, Public Account Committee. That's how we call it, uh, Joanne, the Public Account Committee, uh, to uh, meet the committee in relation to the report that was just done uh, by the Office of the Auditor General on IDRC overall operation. Everything. This is a special examination that takes place once every eight years, ten years now, and where, you know, I can tell you uh, they are looking everywhere. They are looking everywhere in our finance on a yearly basis. They are looking everywhere in our finance and management practice uh, once every ten years. So it's an extremely uh, thorough assessment that they are doing. What have they found? Well, they found that, you know, our governance, you know, had experienced some difficulties in the past, but now the situation, as Margaret was mentioning, has been resolved with the appointment of our governors, and there's still two vacant space, and they will be filled in the future, as it is the government prerogative. The second dimension they found is was that you know parallel funding. What I was mentioning about Tim Wharton need to be better documented and assessed before we engage into this, and we agreed with that. So we have put in place a process to secure that we are not overexposing the center to potential, you know, uh, problem that we are not foreseeing at the beginning of the partnership. And thirdly, because it's an examination of the Auditor General of Canada, they have made a few points about improving our performance measurement, and let me be, tell you that with our board and with our management, we are actively looking at it. We're going to be presenting this, or I'm going to be answering questions at the uh, committee on December 13th. So, you know, tune on CPAC and you might see my face or hear my voice, and hopefully I won't get grilled there. Uh, or if I get grilled, it will be positive. Uh, there's another dimension that you have raised is the youth. And what do we do? Uh, you know, uh, I, I could get an anecdote, you know, there's this uh, bring your children to work every year where I have about a dozen of teenage boys and girls in my office, and we discuss international development. I could tell you that, you know, social media is a nice way to reach out to people and we are increasing our uh, reach with our Facebook, with our Instagram, with our um, Twitter. But there might be an area there for, you know, engaging further with Canadian in, in the future. This said, we have had quite an interesting partnership with the Canadian Geographic News uh, Paper Journal, you know. And uh, two years ago, Joanne has developed with her team quite an interesting program. On a monthly basis, Shawan, we have a storyline of an IDRC project on their website, in their blog, that reach out to how many students in Canada? 200,000, I think, that they are estimating. So you get a story of an IDRC project. The drone project is the one that is featured this, this month. But what you get also is that you have a pedag pedagogical uh, tool, a series of five or six questions that make reference to the text and that are designed for grade 10 student, grade 9, 10 student, a little younger. So. And that way we are hoping that we have an outreach to youth in Canada that get interested not only in international development but in science and in research and making a difference. But, you know, if you have any other great ID at CIC, uh, Margaret, I'll be happy to hear from you in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that, that if there's ways that IDRC can work with CIC because of your network across the country, I think that would be a tremendous way. I think is like in a lot of um, parts of, given that the government is showing a lot of interest in these issues right now, I think IDRC has a huge opportunity to, to begin to tell more of its story, which it hasn't been able to do quite so much in the last few years. So I think there's lots to do. Okay, question from you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, uh, the session. Very informative. So my name is David and I'm from uh, the General Tech, the private sector uh, biotech company in uh, Canada. And we are recipient of Grand Challenges Canada uh, Phase 1 Start Global Health uh, two, two years ago now. We're getting up uh, ready for the Phase 2 scale uh, transition to scale. 
Uh, my question is, in my dealing with our partners in Cameroon and Senegal, I have worked with brilliant scientists who are trained abroad from Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and all complain of the same thing. I could go back home, but there's no infrastructure. So, you know, with the presentation that you were alluding to, I believe that businesses should exist to solve a problem. Making money should be the reward afterwards. And uh, if you look at the capital region here, the public sector employs a lot of people, and there's a private sector. So when you think of low- and middle-income countries, the public sectors cannot employ as many women. Um, suppose we were to build more hospitals, equip them with better infrastructures. Time and time again, in places like like um, H1N1, F5 and H5N1, Ebola, came up because of lack of infrastructure. So my question is, in this era of uh, development funding, is funding more going towards vertical program, is in the Gates Foundation, going to the moonshot uh, solution, or is it something that's not, quote-unquote, innovative, but building hospitals and getting um, sort of the um, post-World War II Marshall Plan for developing countries? Thank you. Mm -hmm. See, Madam Chair, um, that's a very good question. First, uh, let me acknowledge and recognize the good work of uh, Grand Challenges Canada. I've sat on their board until October of this year during the first phase of their life, where IDRC has helped to roll out Grand Challenges Canada, which is a program that is supporting innovation for health, global health. And uh, I'm happy that you are a recipient of uh, a phase one and the phase two scaling up at uh, Grand Challenges Canada. Um, I think the question you are putting to us uh, could be expanded to other areas of the aid agenda. Humanitarian aid, for example, is another dimension. Infrastructure, innovation, research for development. One of the, the things that we have seen over the years is that it's not only one group and one sector that can come with a solution to a long-lasting development problem. If it was the case, food security would have been solved a long time ago. Malaria would have been solved you know, years ago. And, you know, employment, which is something that is now becoming important and women, will have been solved also. And I think one of the challenges that we have is that with numbers of new players and of changing agenda is to stay on course with the support and see through, you know, experiment that takes time. Those development problems are not simple. Malaria has been present with us since ancient times. The number of solutions that have been presented and tailored over the years is huge. But malaria is still present. And why? Because it's intrinsically crossing, you know, border of discipline. It's intrinsically crossing border of agency agenda. And they are part of, you know, in between codes, human condition. And how can we improve? We can only improve if we are rallying together. And in the world of international development, turf territory has no place to be. It's important to collaborate. It's important to identify your niche. But it's important also not to become close to external factor or external contribution. So to answer simply your 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 point, uh, yes, there is room for everyone, but often the coordination is missing and the willingness to engage across different sector is sometimes difficult to address. I've got one more question over here, and then is, is that a two-hander, Tim? Okay. Well, why don't we take the, Thank you uh, very much. <laughs> why don't we take the, uh, just a question over here and then one more from Tim and then I think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, call it a day. So please, <coughs> sir. Um, my name is Govind Gopakumar. I'm an associate professor at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, and the question I had was going back to the previous two questions um, about you know, greater partnership, and I'm thinking between university and, um, uh, and IDRC. And, and what I'm, uh, I have in mind is I teach in an engineering faculty in, uh, at Concordia University. And there's, there's a considerable interest, at least to me, uh, in my mind that 
engineers and engineering um, faculty members are interested in, in enriching their, their student experience and their research experience um, by looking at international cases, both um, for pedagogy as well as for research. Um, uh, and so I'm you know, going back to the, the previous case, uh, answer that you uh, you gave, and I never knew that there were these these short pedagogical tools that were being circulated, and this would be something really interesting for universities um, for for use in courses. I was, uh, the question I had was what mechanisms exist for closer integration, both at pedagogical um, as well as research um, for universities and for students with, with international projects. Uh, some of the, you know, the, the case that was presented was very fascinating. I teach a course on, on development and, um, and technology and innovation, and this would, you know, some of the courses, some of the cases that you speak of would be really useful for this class. Um, so how is it that we can access some of this material? Well, uh, great question, and, and thanks, you know, uh, for coming all the way from Montreal to uh, Ottawa, and uh, my son is at Concordia, so it's a pleasure to see you uh, uh, in the audience. Website of IDRC is the first place to look for. Uh, the number of opportunity that exists for young researcher at the graduate and postgraduate level are all explained there. You know, for example, we have had for, uh, since I think the creation of IDRC, uh, the Canadian Doctoral Research Award uh, that is undersubscribed uh, in my view, but every time I'm in the university, I have the opportunity to speak, I see the people apply. You know, these are 25,000 grants that can be renewed for two years, okay? And uh, it gives you the opportunity after you have completed your uh, scolarity, your courses work, to go to the field, have money to travel, have money to do your field work, and also uh, pay for your equipment, uh, which is most of the time a laptop and a cell phone to operate uh, in the field. Uh, more broadly, there is also our internship program, what we call now research awardees. It's limited. We are taking about 12 research awardees per year. There are some of here that are in the room. I'm not going to say that you didn't recognize me as president in the first week you were at IDRC. That's an anecdote that I was not supposed to say. But Milan, you know, I walk in the corridor and I introduce myself asking Milan, what are you doing? I work in the evaluation unit. And she turned around and says, what are you doing? It was one of the two times in the year I came with jeans, and uh, I said, well, I work in president's office, and, and then she says, uh, what, is your, what is your function? I said, well, I'm the president, and she looked at me, and she says, no. I said, yes, I'm the president, and she looked at me, no, no, you're kidding me. I said, really, I'm the president, and she says, no, and I walked out of her office, and I yell in the corridor, I said, it's fantastic, I have a new research awardee that don't believe I'm the president of IDRC. And I started seeing her melting down under her desk. She had a terrible weekend in Montreal, and I sent her a selfie next to my office with her. It's written, President of IDRC. And I took, put my face behind, and I sent it to her and saying, you made my day. This is one of the best moments in my entire career. You know? <laughs> Research awardees are uh, also an opportunity. Uh, but really, the, 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 the answer is look at the website. And if you have a good idea, you know, as Margaret was saying, bring it to our attention. You know, Canadian Geographic came to uh, a, a meeting that Joanna had. Uh, we will soon have in L'Actualité, you know, uh, stories. We have had over the last two years in Quebec Science, you know, some uh, story uh, of our work. And, you know, uh, the media outreach is extremely difficult in these days and age because the space is shrinking and the journalists uh, are, are not, don't have all the freedom that they would like to cover all the topics that they would like. So, you know, we're trying to engage with them, but we know also of editorial constraint and limitation. Last question. Very, very quick. Um, I'm a great fan of Metro uh, when I get it on the bus every morning.
ceremony. And last week they had a whole series of stories about the gender breakdown of the boards of Canadian Crown Corporations. And you did very well. So congratulations. And uh, presumably under the present chair that will continue. Um, but I would be very glad to have comments because I think that's quite an achievement. Um, and secondly, I didn't want Arjan and Martha to get away scot-free. Uh, very nice to see them and hear them. Uh, I've been very struck going back to Africa with how the digital world is growing in Africa. Um, all the way, obviously, from hot and don Nollywood uh, to M-Pesa, uh, to uh, IBM and Google offices, etc. Uh, obviously, some of these are formal, some are informal. I'd just be glad if your work extends to the, the digital frontier. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll just answer the, the question about the board governance. I think um, the, the current board, uh, there were seven new uh, board uh, governors that were nominated or appointed in June as part of the new uh, open process that the Government of Canada has put in place. Um, so, I, And I was one of them, although I had been on the board before. So I can take no credit for it. But I can tell you that Minister Bibo is absolutely thrilled that, uh, one, that this was, uh, that the IDRC board was uh, basically replenished, and also that it had a majority of, of women on as governors. And so um, I, I give the credit, you know, the process ran its course, but that was the outcome, and I think it is a very good sign. And as you know, the Government of Canada is very keen on promoting the role of, of women and girls in development, and that's why this project that uh, our colleagues here have talked about is, is particularly, I think, relevant right now. Over to you. So we have a growing portfolio of projects on financial inclusion, so we are working on uh, digital technology. We are excited about that because I think it provides uh, an opportunity to break the gender barriers. It also provides an opportunity to engage the young people who would be embracing the technology faster. So our aim, so we were working with some of the uh, financial service providers to really see where does the next MPESA come from and how, how does research support the generation of new innovations that actually bring the low-income, marginalized women and youth uh, into productive life. So our hope is, I think we've seen some, I've seen some statistics that to close the gender gap in developing countries, it takes 75 years if there's a status quo. But if we can accelerate that, then we can reduce it by half. So we are hoping that our work contributes to accelerating the reduction of gender gap, but also the gap in terms of the youth participation. Carolyn, do you want to add a, have the final word? Excellent. <laughs> that was pretty clear. <laughs> I like my staff. <laughs> that was great. Well, let's end on that note then. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming out today. I want to thank IDRC's partners, um, friends uh, of IDRC. Uh, pass the word. I want to give a special shout out and thank you to Joanne Charette and all her team who pulled together the annual general meeting. And I think on behalf of the Board of Governors, I'd just like to thank Jean and, and everybody on the IDRC staff for the tremendous work they've done over the last year. And we're really looking forward to working with them and to building the community of interest around IDRC and what the Government of Canada is doing in the area of research for development. So thank you very much.